Welcome to part 3 of Enteral Nutrition. There are a number of YouTube videos available on the internet to help you review the correct nursing skills that you've learned on the administration of a tube feeding, tube site cleaning, assuring the correct water in the balloon of a peg tube, pulling aspirate, checking residuals, abdominal auscultation, and a number of other skills. However, in this particular video, we're going to focus on the nutrition-related potential problems in tube feeding management. One common problem is constipation. As we said in the earlier presentation, most all patients on a tube feeding are going to need extra water. A standard formula is typically 85% water. That leaves another 15% that needs to be accounted for. The formulas that are more concentrated or have extra fiber will also place additional fluid demands on the patient. The exceptions to this rule are conditions where fluid restriction is warranted, such as congestive heart failure or kidney failure, and in infant formulas that are completely fluid adequate. You'd also want to review medications. Many pain medications, for example, slow digestion and cause constipation. Sometimes it's helpful to try a formula with fiber, but remember from our previous presentation, the fluid uh, needs will be increased, perhaps a larger bore tube since formula containing products often clog the tube, and Formula containing fibers may impact medication absorption. It's also possible to add a modular product such as Benafiber to a tube feeding, but this will impact hang time. Whenever a closed system has some modular product added to it, be it protein or fiber or extra fat such as MCT oil, the hang time will be reduced to only four hours. This is because um, manipulating the feeding introduces uh, bacteria and increases the risk of um, bacterial contamination to the formula. If it's possible, increase patient activity, getting them up, having them walk around, uh, you know, consulting with uh, the PT department to see if you can get the patient to walk is also helpful in the prevention and management of constipation. As a last resort, add a laxative. Another problem related to enteral feeding is diarrhea. It's actually quite high in the hospital setting. One of the things that needs to be considered though is a uh, distinguish distinguishing between diarrhea and mushy stool. Diarrhea is defined as watery stools more than three times a day and in excess of 500 milliliters. Mushy stools and diarrhea are not the same thing. The latter indicates that the gut is not functioning properly in terms of digesting and absorbing food. Sometimes giving the patient elemental or hydrolyzed formulas that we talked about earlier may produce mushy stools, but this is not diarrhea. It doesn't mean that the patient is not absorbing their food uh, if the stool is not hard formed. In order of occurrence, the primary causes are first medications, many times antibiotics that have disrupted the normal microflora of the intestine. The rate of tube feeding delivery can cause diarrhea. Sometimes it's the formula composition and changing the formula to another kind could help. However, it's not the first area of investigation that should be considered. Again, look first at medications and the rate of delivery. Another problem is aggressive refeeding. Sometimes patients have uh, refeeding syndrome that we'll talk about shortly. It's always best to start low and go slow. Perhaps the patient's diagnosis is the problem. 
Maybe they have uh, liver disease or pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis, some other type of uh, situation that's causing the problem. Maybe there's an opportunistic infection such as C. difficile. Patient stress. Fecal impaction uh, can also result in diarrhea. The watery portion of a tube feeding simply bypasses the impacted area. The patient may be uh, treated actually for diarrhea when impaction is the problem. This actually occurs quite frequently. It's also one of the reasons why uh, imaging tests are often conducted uh, to assess the patient's abdomen. Malnutrition can contribute to diarrhea as well. Villous atrophy can result in nutrition going through the GI tract with no uh, digestion or absorption. You might see this in patients who have uh, severe uh, food intolerance that's gone untreated for a long time, such as uh, uh, someone who is uh, gluten intolerant or a case of cystic fibrosis or Crohn's disease. So check for C. difficile or another infection. It's important to keep the patient hydrated, perhaps with IV. Look at the medications. Remember that liquid medicines often have high osmolarity, so if it's possible to change that to a, a pill that needs to be crushed, that would be better. One uh, area that comes to mind is giving patients who have end-stage liver disease, lactulose. Lactulose is designed uh, to, to help lower the ammonia levels in these patients, but a side effect is diarrhea. Now, although we want the patients to have two or three stools a day while on lactulose, we certainly don't want explosive diarrhea with stomach pains, and so the medication would need to be titrated down to uh, achieve the proper results and perhaps consider um, another medicine to help that uh, would prevent us from having to use too much lactulose. Again, determine if it's, uh, if it's really diarrhea and change out the formula or add a modular product. Check for tube migration to the post pyloric area. Consider the formula temperature. Cold or hot formulas are more likely to cause diarrhea than room temperature. When patients are struggling with diarrhea, watch their electrolytes and use an oral rehydrating solution where indicated. You can also add anti-diarrheal medications. Change your titrate medications to a lower dose. Make sure that the formula is handled safely and that we haven't prevented uh, excessive we haven't caused bacterial infection and contamination due to excessive hang time. You might also consider changing to a hydrolyzed product that the patient would tolerate better. And some formulas have fructooligosaccharides added to their products. These are pro and prebiotics that are used to normalize the intestinal environment. There's some evidence that they do work in some situations. I also know that many ICU departments across the country are using um, pro and prebiotic supplements in the ICU setting to prevent diarrhea. Something else that's important to remember is pump calibration. Think about how long it takes for a certain volume of formula to be delivered to your patient. If it seems that that um, that bag of formula empty pretty rapidly in spite of the pump setting you might want to call the um, hospital staff responsible for the equipment and calibrate that pump to make sure it's delivering the correct amount over the set time. Other problems that you might notice if you work uh, in a long-term part of the hospital or in long-term care would be weight loss and weight gain. Again, it could be caused by diarrhea, dehydration, uh, poor activity or increased metabolic activity brought on by stress and disease, formula infusion. Uh, one of the things that I noticed when I worked in uh, long-term care is that 
uh, many times we fail to account for patient time off of the pump. We had uh, children where I worked, they were transported to and from school. During that time, they were off their pump. Um, it took some time for the nurse to restart that once they got to school. When they came home, again, it was another issue of an hour of being off the pump. And then when it was bath time, of course, the pump was stopped. So uh, a patient could miss up to three, four, five hours a day of their feeding. And even though the order may be for you know, a, a tube feeding up to 18 hours a day, if they're missing that, it's going to certainly impact their weight. Some patients may feel nausea and vomiting. This could be caused by constipation, side effect of medications, or tube feeding intolerance. Tube feeding intolerance can be checked by auscultation of the abdomen, uh, excessive residuals, you can uh, check abdominal girth and residuals on your patient. It's important to keep up with their intake and output and their uh, bowel activity. It's also good to make sure the tube hasn't migrated and think about proper administration. Many times I have seen uh, hurried, harried nurses trying to get their work done and get done with their shift, but they will feed the patient so quickly that they are unable to tolerate their boluses. There are some other enteral complications to be considered. Nasal pulmonary intubation, aspiration, sinusitis, cranial insertion has happened before with terrible results, um, esophageal and intestinal perforation, and uh, peg site problems and gastrointestinal complications. I know a couple of years ago there was a case of a student nurse at in uh, one of the hospitals in Georgia who inadvertently poured the feeding into the trach tube and uh, of course the patient did die. Uh, that sounds far-fetched but um, it could happen. And they're right there in the, in the hospital setting or in a home environment where someone's not familiar with the care of a patient. So uh, very important to, um, to think of all the problems that could happen and, and ward those off. So if we think about aspiration, this is secretions into the lung and it is uh, characterized by coughing, wheezing, frequent infections, uh, necrotic tissue and even death can happen and sometimes it's silent aspiration, it's intermittent aspiration. Uh, patients who are fed by tube are at much greater risk than those who are fed by mouth. This is because they're often in a supine position, larger diameter tubes may be used, they may be on medications that delay gastric emptying such as pain medicines or propofol, Advancing age generally uh, reduces the GI tract transit time, or I'm sorry, increases transit time. Neuromuscular disorders such as stroke or um, developmental disabilities can cause problems. Uh, decreased consciousness, ileus, obstruction, a dislodged tube, or a high fat formula that's sometimes used in special cases can all contribute to risk. Aspiration is the leading cause of pneumonia in acute care and it's a serious side effect of enteral feeding. As I said before, it can be silent or the patient may actually present with some symptoms. In addition to pneumonia, aspiration may also cause atelectasis, bronchitis, and ARDS. Risk factors include decreased consciousness, endotracheal intubation, vomiting, and persistently high gastric residuals. And by that, we mean more than 250 to 500 mils of residual on two consecutive occasions within four hours. And I want you to make special note of that. I'll say it once more. Uh, persistently high gastric residuals is defined as between 250 and 500 mils pulled back on two consecutive occasions within a four-hour window.
prolonged supine position or prone position as in mechanical ventilation, bolus feeding, nasoenteric feeding, delayed gastric emptying, which is high in diabetics, high fat or high, fabula, high fiber formulas, medications, and large diameter tubes all contribute to this predisposition of aspiration. Sometimes it's difficult to determine if aspiration is actually occurring. So prevention across the board is the mainstay. Glucose strips to measure aspirate, say in an intubated person, doesn't really work well, so this practice has been abandoned. Dyes must not be used either. pH strips offer a better picture. But again, clinical skills are most needed in checking a patient for aspiration. We don't want to just use one, um, one possible indicator like residuals or just a pH strip or just that the patient says he doesn't feel well. So again, 250 to 500 on two or more occasions within four hours indicates a need to possibly hold the feeding and assess tolerance. But I must tell you that there are cases where people have had residuals of three, four, five hundred and had no indication whatsoever that they were intolerant to the feeding and that they did not have and they didn't have any indication that they were aspirating. So we don't want to just use uh, one marker. Many times patients have um, been underfed because people are afraid with residuals as little as 100 or 200 mils, uh, they'll hold the feeding and it's just not necessary. Look at the residual. Does it look like undigested formula? Does it look like gastric juices or a combination? If the patient appears to be fine, return the residual. When it's high and occurring frequently within that four hour window, careful bedside monitoring, monitoring should happen. Remember, a high GRV does not predict aspiration. Promotility agents is encouraged and of course keeping the head of the bed at 45 degrees during feeding is encouraged. Assuring correct tube placement, minimizing the use of narcotics, and continuing uh, using a continuous feed instead of bolus feedings can all help. I think most people are aware that we no longer use dyes in formula. This uh, many years ago, people would put dye, blue dye, in formula, and if they saw that it was coming out in their um, secretions. They felt like that uh, this would be an indication of aspiration, but unfortunately it uh, caused liver failure and it had an iceberg effect. Uh, the, the patient was already quite toxic by the time liver symptoms became apparent or their skin began to turn blue. So it was uh, unfortunate that it took such a long time for people to realize that this was causing shock, increased intestinal permeability, acidosis, and death. We also want to talk about preventing bacterial contamination. These are very important times that you need to make note of. Ready to hang or closed system formulas can be ordered they significantly reduce contamination opportunities for your patients. All the nurse has to do is spike and hang it and it can stay there for up to 36 hours based on the manufacturer's recommendations. It depends really on what the uh, recipe for the formula is as to how long it can can remain um, sta hanging on that patient. These formulas are more expensive but they do require a little less involvement with nursing as far as going around and, and preparing the tubing and hanging the formula and restarting the pumps and everything um, compared to the open systems. So many 
nursing homes are using these more expensive formulas. Uh, it's just um, I don't want to discourage or, or encourage the idea that a patient doesn't need to be checked just because they have these formulas that can hang a long time. But um, most places do find if you have a lot of tube fed individuals that the uh, ready to hang systems are cost beneficial. An open system where you know you would go and take a can and pour it in a bag and hang it, it can hang up to eight hours. Tubing and bag must be discarded after 24 hours. So again, very important that you know these times. Now if you have to add a modular powder or if you have to reconstitute a powdered product and hang it on a patient, it can hang no more than four hours. These are the most likely to be uh, contaminated. Most uh, powders are obviously not, um, they're not bacteria free and so once you add water to them the bacteria begin to grow. This is true of infant formula. Powdered infant formula is not sterile. So they, it also has uh, less hang time. The use of homemade formulas in hospitals and nursing homes has been abandoned since the 1980s because uh, they're not a standard product. We're not sure exactly what the patient is getting. There's an increased risk of contamination and nutrient deficiencies. However, in recent years, because of cases of tube feeding intolerance and family demands, there are exceptions to this rule. All bags should be labeled and dated so that the hang time is not exceeded. It should also include the name of the formula and what the order for the delivery rate should be. All patients, even though they're tube fed, should be given oral care. I well remember the case of a child who had received all foods via tube for about eight years in the home environment and the family failed to provide oral care. At the age of 16, she had to have all of her teeth removed because of irreversible gum disease. Her teeth looked fine, but um, because of poor oral care, uh, the dentition below the gum line was terribly necrotic. Refeeding syndrome. Can't emphasize this enough. Uh, refeeding syndrome has killed a number of patients. Uh, perhaps some of you might remember a, um, a brother-sister duo from the 70s. They still play their music, the Carpenters. Uh, Karen Carpenter suffered from an eating disorder. She was hospitalized numerous times and uh, on her last hospitalization she was fed via tube too aggressively and actually died of refeeding syndrome. Uh, causing cardiac arrest. So refeeding syndrome does happen and it is defined as rapid overfeeding in, of a malnourished patient. Introducing food into the GI tract that has been severely food restricted uh, can increase the cardiac load causing an increase of anabolic hormones, hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia. It's very important that you monitor the electrolytes, particularly phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, monitor glucose, and start feeding very slowly and advance slowly in these patients. Refeeding syndrome affects uh, adversely nearly every organ system. It's important to watch for cardiac dysrhythmias and heart failure. The primary cause is the shift from stored body fat being used for metabolism to carbohydrate as the primary fuel source. This is going to cause serum insulin levels to rise and the intracellular movement of electrolytes for use in metabolism. So the best advice, as I said before, is start low and go slow. To reduce the risk of refeeding syndrome, number one is recognize the patients at risk. Think about those with anorexia nervosa. Check for classic quashiorquor or marasmus. 
malnutrition that you might see in wasting diseases such as congestive heart failure, AIDS, or cancer, chronic alcoholism, prolonged fasting or prolonged IV hydration without food, significant stress and depletion. We had a case once where a young boy was um, again taken care of at home, had not seen his physician for a number of years, received uh, tube feeding formula, but it had never been advanced. He had to be taken to the hospital. The hospital gave him the proper amount of tube feeding and he went into cardiac arrest from uh, refeeding. We were able to, uh, to save him, but we had to slowly begin to increase his formula. In many cases, if you suspect that a patient is at risk, you would want to correct the electrolyte abnormalities before starting nutritional support and then give volume slowly, monitor their pulse, their INO and their electrolytes, provide appropriate vitamin supplementation such as thiamine, and avoid overfeeding. Of course, underfeeding delays healing, so it's important to calculate the needs as accurately as possible and monitor the patient. To talk briefly about tube feeding syndrome, it is characterized by azotemia, hypernatremia, and dehydration. Generally, it's caused by the use of excessive protein in tube feedings. This causes a high renal solute load and inadequate amounts of water. Many times this is brought about by misuse of modular products or powdered formulas where they just give them too much protein and not enough extra fluid. This will cause a hemoconcentration and will increase the sodium and blood urea nitrogen in your patient. So avoid protein overload, get your RD to come in and evaluate how much protein is actually needed, particularly if you have a patient where you're trying to heal a, a wound such as a burn or pressure ulcer. Provide adequate fluid and whenever possible just use a standard formula. So we've started our feeding, but monitoring is critical. We want to be sure that we confirm proper tube placement. Maintain a proper elevation of the head of the bed. Make sure the patient's back is above the bend in that bed. I've often seen patients being fed who've slumped down and even though the bed's in the proper position, the patient isn't. Change the delivery system as we mentioned earlier. Check for tube patency. Careful records of INO and body weight, critical. Uh, assess the stool frequency, volume, and consistency. Uh, the abdomen, monitor for edema, hydration, gastric residual volume, auscultation, monitor the electrolytes, all very important. And conditions that you should report to the MD, probably obvious to you. Again, I'll tell you about one more case that we had. Uh, we had a child that we saw with brown exudate around his peg site. Uh, during my assessment, I also noted the same material was in his mouth. We took some hemocult strips and determined it wasn't blood, but I immediately sent him across town to his doctor, who took one look at him and transferred him to Children's, and they found that he had severe fecal impaction, so much that it was actually in his oral cavity. So. Uh, that this patient had no other signs and symptoms of tube feeding intolerance. What was happening is that the liquid portion was simply bypassing this uh, large area of impacted fecal, uh, fecal matter. So very important to monitor and refer your patients where indicated.